In this lab, we'll be exploring solubility. The guiding principle to remember is like dissolves like. The idea is that polar compounds dissolve in polar solvents like water, and nonpolar compounds dissolve in nonpolar solvents like, say, diethyl ether. This idea of like dissolves like is what makes this comic by Tyler Larson so funny to some people. Hilarious, I know, but the idea is there. What we're going to do in this lab is separate two compounds by adjusting their polarity, thereby adjusting their solubility. Tear the mass of your weigh paper and then weigh 50 milligrams of your 9-fluoronone and your ethyl 4 aminobenzoate. Add your two compounds to your centrifuge tube. Now add 4 milliliters of diethyl ether to your centrifuge tube and place it in an ice bath. Add about 2 milliliters of 3 molar HCl dropwise to the centrifuge tube while swirling. 2 milliliters of HCl is about 2 thirds of an inch of solution. This will protonate our ethyl 4 aminobenzoate so it can make hydrogen bonds and dissolve into the aqueous layer. Once you've added your acid, invert with venting. Remove the bottom aqueous layer and place in a 10 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask. We'll get the 9-fluoronone out of the ether layer still in the tube later, so make sure you put it somewhere safe. Now you'll add your 6-molar NaOH to the solution until the pH is basic. This will deprotonate ethyl 4 aminobenzoate, causing it to be insoluble in water and precipitate to the bottom. Here you can see that ethyl 4 aminobenzoate is precipitating out of solution. To get all the product we can, we will add base until the pH is basic. Check the pH every 15 to 20 drops of base by using a glass stir rod and letting a drop touch the red litmus paper. Eventually, you'll see a blue dot indicating that your solution is now basic. Once the litmus paper turns blue, cool your solution for 10 to 15 minutes. Now we're going to set up a filtration apparatus to catch our ethyl 4 aminobenzoate solid. You'll need a Buchner funnel, a rubber adapter, a hose that will attach to the faucet, a piece of filter paper, and a filter flask. Start by turning on the water to create a vacuum and lightly wet the filter paper with distilled water. Now add the aqueous solution to the filter. When all the water has been filtered, wash the filter paper with water. Allow your solid ethyl 4 aminobenzoate to dry for 3 to 4 minutes with the water running. Tear a watch glass by recording its mass. After drying, turn off the water, remove your funnel, and gently slide out the filter paper. Scrape as much of the ethyl 4 aminobenzoate as possible onto the teared watch glass. Weigh the watch glass and ethyl 4 aminobenzoate and calculate the percent recovery. We'll show you how to measure the melting point at the end of the video. To the organic layer left over in the centrifuge tube, we're going to add two portions of one milliliters of water. 
After washing, you'll remove the bottom aqueous layer for disposal. Now to our remaining organic layer, we'll add anhydrous sodium sulfate. Keep adding anhydrous sodium sulfate until there is no more clumping. Tear a 10 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask by recording its mass. With a bowling stone added, transfer your dry diethyl ether into your teared Erlenmeyer flask. Wash the sodium sulfate with one milliliter of diethyl ether, and then you'll remove that diethyl ether and add it to the Erlenmeyer flask. Now boil off the diethyl ether. Note that the heat does not have to be very high. The lab says you'll have a yellow liquid left over after boiling. The boiling doesn't take very long. You know you're done when there are very few bubbles showing up on the boiling stone and the bottom of the flask is pretty warm to the touch. Once it's done boiling, remove the flask from the hot plate and allow it to cool to room temperature. Here you can see that once the 9-fluoronone solution has gotten to room temperature, it becomes a solid. Weigh and record the mass of the 9-fluoronone and the Erlenmeyer flask. Okay, now we have our two solids that we're going to measure the melting temperature for. Uh, measuring the melting temperature tells us something about how pure our product is. Now we need to put our solids inside of a capillary tube. Uh, this tube has a top and a bottom. There's an open side and a closed side. So we're going to turn it upside down, put the open side down, and we're going to smash a little bit of our product in there. Once you have your product in your capillary tube, you use this amazing gravitational device and put in the closed side first, and it drops to the bottom. And that will put your solid down into the bottom of the tube. So this is the Digimelt, and we're going to be sampling our 9-fluoronone sample first. And 9-fluoronone has a melting temperature between 80 and 83 degrees Celsius. So we're going to choose start and stop temperatures that are slightly lower and slightly higher than that range. Push the start temperature button and use the up and down buttons to make sure that this number is slightly lower than the 80 degrees Celsius for 9-fluoronone. So we set ours to 77. Next you're going to push ramp rate. And this is how many degrees per minute the temperature is going to increase. So typically two is good. Next you're going to press the stop temp. And this is the temperature that is slightly higher than the 83 degrees. So we have ours set to 85. But you can use the up arrow or down arrow to adjust as needed. OK, so everything's set up now. Uh, we're just going to press the start stop button. And you'll see that the temperature will start to ramp up to our start temperature. temperature of the Digimel is at your start temperature. The ready light will turn on and it will be green. And you're going to take your 9-fluoronone capillary tube and you're going to put it into one of the three holes at the top of the Digimel. It doesn't matter which hole you put it into. And then you're going to press start. This is the view when you're looking inside the Digimel. How the look of the substance changes helps you determine when to record your melting temperature. You'll need to record a range starting from the moment the substance looks wet and starts to glisten to the point when the substance is completely melted. Sometimes it's hard to tell when wet is, but you know the substance has for sure begun to melt when you start to see some movement and collapse, shown here. This is what it looks like when the substance is completely melted.